Here's what Time Magazine said about Jeb Bush's bid for political office. He once described himself as a head-banging conservative, but is suddenly taking his campaign into places where few Republicans have gone before. Black churches and schools, Hispanic neighborhoods, condo units full of elderly, staunchly Democratic Jews in rural counties on the Jordan border, where Republicans are still scarce. The year those words were written were 1998. Jeb Bush was making his second bid, a successful one, to become Florida's governor. Right after Time Magazine wrote those words, Jeb Bush addressed the Forum Club, something he had declined to do during his first unsuccessful bid. <laughs> he then came back to speak to us as governor. Following his time as governor, he returned to the private sector and devoted his time to issues he is passionate about, including educational reform. In 2013, he offered immigration wars, forging an American solution, outlining a conservative reform strategy to fix the nation's broken immigration system. Please join me in welcoming former governor, current Republican presidential candidate, and South Florida's own Jeb Bush. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you all very much. Hope you had a Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday time, and we're all hopefully going to have a prosperous and healthy New Year. It is a delight to be here. I was kind of worried about the crowd size between Christmas and New Year's, but um, you love your Forum Club, that's for sure, and I'm delighted to be here. A lot has passed uh, in my life. A lot, a lot of things have happened since I last came here to speak. Most importantly, for those that have gone through this experience, I'm a grandfather now. And uh, as the old story goes, if I'd known this was so good, I would have skipped over the first part. And, sorry, Noel, and gone right to, <laughs> right to the grandkids. Uh, my first granddaughter is named Georgia Helena Walker Bush. For those that know anything about the Bush family, that's kind of an important name. I call her 43. That's her nickname. <laughs> and Georgia represents in many ways the future of our country if we get it right. Because Georgia is, let me see if I can get this right. Georgia's mom is a Canadian whose parents are Iraqi. Georgia's dad is a Texan, Floridian by choice, Texan by birth. That's a foreign country, I think, or at least they claim they are. And and Georgia's uh, grandma is from Mexico. Her abue is, is from Leon, Guanajuato, Mexico. So that means in the world of identity politics, which seems to be really important these days in American political life, that Georgia is a Mexican, Texan, Canadian, Iraqi American, a quadra hyphenated American. <laughs> and that's actually good, not bad, just for the record. It's good if we have a set of shared values, a common purpose, our diversity is our strength. And when, if we get this right, if we get back on track, if we focus on the things that are broken and fix them, when Georgia turns 21 and fills out the godforsaken census form and she has to say what her identity is, she'll say not applicable. She's an American. And that's what we should have in our country. Little Georgia, trilingual Georgia's got 17 years left to be able to fill out that form. And I'm hopeful and optimistic that we're on the verge of the greatest time to be alive in this country. But it's going to require leadership to fix a few big complex things to make it so. We have real challenges in our country and people are legitimately concerned. We turn on the television and see threats of terror that we could have never imagined not that long ago. A caliphate the size of Indiana. 30 to 40,000 battle-tested Islamic terrorists. Our president can't even call it what it is. He puts restrictions on top of the war fighters, does not have a strategy, brags about containment, and then within hours, the Paris attacks takes place. And then the San Bernardino attack takes place. In August, I had a chance to go to the Reagan Library where I laid out a strategy to destroy ISIS, not to contain it, not to make it a law enforcement exercise, but to realize that this is the threat of our time, that we need serious leadership to be able to destroy ISIS. And if we do, we'll create a more peaceful world. And it starts by arming the Kurds directly, with this, which this president refuses to do. 
It requires embedding our troops that are already in Iraq to be inside the, Ara the Iraqi military, to help them, to fortify them, to rebuild that military so that it can create security in a post-ISIS world. It requires re-engaging with the Sunni tribal leaders that, by doing so, created the surge that led to a fragile but secure Iraq the day that Barack Obama was, was uh, elected President of the United States. It requires safe zones in Syria. If we're serious about the humanitarian crisis that exists, and I believe as Americans we have a heart for people, four million refugees that are in refugee camps by and large, a breeding ground for Islamic terrorism if we do nothing, if we care about them, then we should have safe zones there. And we should get our Arab friends to be able to provide financial support to create a unified force, not just disparate forces, but a unified force to destroy ISIS and bring about a political settlement where Assad leaves. And that means we need a no-fly zone in Syria as well. For those that are worried, oh my gosh, that might offend Vladimir Putin, so be it. Putin should be more worried about our air superiority than we should be worried about his. The simple fact is when we pull back, voids are filled. And they're filled by these asymmetric threats of terror and by nation states seeing America's weakness as a chance to move forward and reestablish them in places they don't deserve to be. Donald Trump may like Vladimir Putin because he praised him, and that's the great thing to do. You can't, the best thing you can do with Trump is say something nice about him. He immediately like, thinks you're a wonderful person. <laughs> Putin may think that, but he's wrong. He's wrong. Trump may think that about Putin, but he's wrong. He's a bully. He's not a force for good. The United States needs to lead. And the speech I gave at the Reagan Library was based on the fact that I believe we need to restore peace through strength once again in our country. Peace through strength is not a cliche. It means we need to rebuild our military capabilities that have been gutted because of the sequester over the last few years. It, needs, it means that we have to have cybersecurity capabilities second to none, both defensive and offensive. It means that the president needs to recognize that our military needs to be supported rather than told to create social policies. This president puts restrictions on the warfighters way beyond what the traditional restrictions are of the international warfare, making it harder and harder for us to be successful. I promise you, should I be President of the United States, I'll be a commander-in-chief, not a divider-in-chief, not an agitator-in-chief, someone that will respect the military and provide the necessary support so that we can get back to peace through strength. Secondly, we're living in times where the economy is not working. It's not working at all. No wonder people are angry and anxious about the future. In the last seven years, disposable income has declined by $2,300, the median. Think about that. Think of what that means for people as they try to organize their future. It may mean that they can't provide care for their elder mom who might have dementia. It means that they have to do it themselves, making it harder and harder for them to live a life of purpose and meaning. It may mean that they can't survive uh, living paycheck to paycheck. It may mean that they can't provide an education for their child that desperately wants to go to college. Everything around the middle class today is making it harder for people to be successful. And for us to be successful as a nation, we don't measure our success by the size and scope of government. We measure it by the hopes and dreams of people interacting amongst ourselves in a free society, creating prosperity for all of us. And to do that, we need to recognize that our government's not working. Plain and simple, we have the most convoluted tax code in the world. We create, unless you're powerful, where you can get the special deal, where you can get your snout in the front end of the trough, if you will, you're not, you're not gonna make it because of the, higher, the highest tax rates in the corporate, in the, in the international world. Corporate tax rates of 38% make it uncompetitive for our country. And individuals having all sorts of uh, compliance costs and, and costs that make it harder for us to be able to rise up. I have proposed the most detailed plan to lift our economy up and have growing income by reforming dramatically our tax code and reforming dramatically our regulatory system. Three months ago, four months ago, I was in, in western Pits, uh, Pennsylvania at a brand spanking new building called for the corporate headquarters of a company called Rice Energy. Rice Energy was formed less than 10 years ago on the couch of a rental apartment in Pittsburgh. Two brothers in their late 20s decided they would take a chance. They borrowed money from their family, they borrowed money from friends, and they went at it. And they were lucky 
and they were successful, and they showed good fortune, all the things that happen when people are successful in pursuit of their dreams. They, along with many other people, took two existing technologies that have been around a long time, hydro hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, and created a revolution. Compare that to Washington, D.C., and the big thinkers there inside the venture capital of arm of the Department of Energy, where they thought they were smart enough to pick winners and losers in the energy market. They lost almost every one of them. You remember Solyndra? There are scores of those businesses that outright failed. But two kids, in the pursuit of their own dreams, created a business where there are 600 employees that own shares now in a public company with a market capitalization rate in the billions of dollars. Which side are we going to be on? People who want to take risks and pursue their dreams in a free market or outsource all of that to the big central planners that think they're smarter than the rest of us? Well, I'm with the Rice Brothers, just like America was with the Wright Brothers. And speaking of the Wright Brothers, uh, Bob Crippen is here, an astronaut uh, on Shuttle One. We honor you for your courage. I, for one, uh, believe that we need to re-engage in the space program. We need to be much more rigorous and much more involved in it. I hope that's a bipartisan kind of concept. The final thing I want to say before we open it up for, for Q&A is that I believe that life is a gift from God. If you start from that premise, you have a whole different kind of set of views about what life's about. It seems to me, for conservatives to win, we need to be on the side of people that want to rise up. If we believe that everybody has, can make a contribution to society, then we shouldn't tell people what line to get into. We should build capacity for them to achieve earned success. I tried to do that as governor of the state of Florida by creating a world-class business climate, working with business communities here and all across the state, and working with the Florida legislature. We led the nation in job growth during my eight years. 1.3 million jobs were created. State government actually shrunk by 13,000, but 1.3 million net new jobs were created. They called me Vito Corleone. Sorry, Lois. Not to be punitive, because I was an equal opportunity veto. Sorry, Jeff. The simple fact was that government was growing faster than our ability to pay for it. Income should grow faster than government if we're to be successful. And I tried to do that as governor. But it's based on the premise that life is special, that it is divinely inspired. In 1998, Ed mentioned this, I was, I was a candidate, and I decided I was going to wander around a little bit rather than lay out my five-point plan and tell people how great I was. Um, that's like the 16 campaign for some of the candidates. In my case, I, I was in a town hall meeting in Fort Lauderdale, and I met a woman named Berthe Aponte de la Rosa, who's one of my closest friends now. She was angry at this, in this meeting, and she would not let me up for air. In effect, I couldn't charm her, I couldn't convince her that I cared about her family and about her daughter, Luz, who at the time was 15 years old. She told me in front of a crowd of a couple hundred people that Luz couldn't talk, she couldn't walk, she was severely autistic, she had physical ailments the likes of which you can't imagine, and she had an IQ of 50. But in Berthy's mind, she was as special as anybody in that room. I couldn't convince her I cared because I was a conservative. Apparently, conservatives don't care about people in the minds, kind of the mindset of the time, and to this day, I still hear that, which is absolutely ridiculous. But I couldn't convince her, so I said, tell you what, I'll be the student. You be the teacher. Teach me what it's like to wake up every morning wondering whether you're going to outlive your child, because that was her biggest concern. Imagine that. And so she did. She took me up on it. I went to visit group homes all across South Florida. I went to those institutionalized care settings, some of which were good, all of them were expensive, some of which were warehousing people. They weren't treating people with dignity and respect. I went to workplaces where people with different abilities, people with all sorts of disabilities, if you will, were, were part of the workforce, and the employees there loved it, and so did the customers. I learned a lot being a student from Berthe Aponte de la Rosa. And when my time came to be elected governor, I did the first week, I went to a federal judge in, in South Florida, in Miami, who was going to take over the program for the developing disabled. And I begged him not to do it. I told him I now more, know more about this program than probably most elected officials. We can fix this. 
There was a 31,000 person waiting list to get care. And he let me up for air, thankfully. And I went to the Florida legislature and we transformed those programs in a bipartisan way. And over 18 months, we whittled down that waiting list to where it went away completely. In essence, 31,000 families did not worry as much as they did before whether they were going to outlive their precious child. That is what I believe Republicans and conservatives should be about. We should be about lifting people up, <laughs> reforming the things that are broken to lift people up, eliminate the lids on people's aspirations, and this country will take off. Imagine a country where everybody reaches their full potential, their God-given potential. I can promise you it will be a country that is full of hope and optimism, a country that will inspire and lead the world, and a country where our children and grandchildren will have more opportunities than what we have. That is my mission. I hope you have a heart for it because I'm sick and tired of the politics of divide, the politics of destruction, the politics of anger. We need to start fixing some things, and if we do, this country will take off. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Governor. We have three questions from our students, and we will begin with a question from South Fork High School. Hello, my name is Sierra Scott, and I'm an international baccalaureate student at South Fork High School. Governor Bush, my question for you is, when you were governor of Florida, you passed the Stand Your Ground law. Currently, guns account for 75% of all murders, an increase from when your law was passed in 2005, when it was 56%. Do you still fully support this law, given the drastic increase in gun violence? I do. In fact, gun violence uh, is down. I don't know where you're getting a statistic. Gun violence in Florida is down because we have severe laws that penalize people that commit crimes with guns. That's the path to create a safer community, is to have laws like 1020 Life and others where if you commit a crime with a gun, there's going to be certainty that you're going to be in prison. Gun violence in other places, Chicago being the best example, this last year is up. It's not up because of the lack of gun control. It's up because there has been lawlessness on the streets. And the solution to that, in my mind, is to create a safe community. I think I'm afraid, at least, that I have no evidence uh, of this other than anecdotes of talking to police officers, that the police now feel like community policing is not worth it, that the risks are too high that the penalties are too high for them to do their job in the community. And I think that is creating more lawlessness than otherwise. And so I think we need to reestablish trust in these communities and make sure that law enforcement is empowered and has the back of all elected officials for them to do their job. If you have a question for the governor, please hold it up at your table. We'll have a volunteer come and pick it up. The second question from students are from Palm Beach Central High School. Nope. The second question from students are from Palm Beach Atlantic University. Yes, sir. Oh, perfect. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for speaking to us today. My name is Melody Peters, and my question is, with the People's Republic of China going so far as to build its own artificial islands in the South China Sea, how do we ensure stability in the Western Pacific, and what would be the most effective means for the United States to address the flaunting of international law by the Chinese? First of all, let's just pause for a moment. Uh, if I had a press gaggle right now, it'd be all about things that are so trivial. That was actually the most substantive question I've heard in a long while, and I appreciate it. <laughs> now, now i got to answer it. <laughs> Look, the Chinese would not have built this island 100 miles off their coast in the South China Sea unless they felt that the United States was in a weakened position. Their, their objectives are long-term objectives of dominance of the region. That's, what they, that's, that's their path that they're on. And for us to, to resist that, we need to be engaged in the region. Our friends need to know that we have their back. And in, in the case of Asia, there's examples where we show support to Japan and Korea, and then there's examples where we don't. And I think it ought to be consistent. One of the things that we could do to show our support to the rest of the region is to support the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, because that is what they're waiting for. They're waiting to see if we're serious 
of having a long-term presence in Asia, if we do not support that agreement, I can guarantee you that they're going to make accommodations to deal with a much more aggressive China. Secondly, we should not have any discussions about the international legal status of these islands that this, this base was created to try to, to, try to uh, pressure the world in accepting China's status, which is not legal. We need to be on the side of international law in this case, which means that we should use whatever resources we have. The president shouldn't even have to announce that he's flying over international airspace, but now our Defense Department does that. We should just do it as a matter of course. These are international airspace and international waters. Our Navy should flow through there to make sure that, that China knows that we're there to support the standards that exist to protect the, the trading system and to protect our allies. Thirdly, I think when you pivot to Asia, you better do it. If you're going to say you're going to do it, because the rest of the world says, well, why are you pivoting away from us? And in Asia, if you travel there, which I did in my post-governor's life probably too much, they say, well, you only talk about pivoting when you're out here. It doesn't appear that you're that serious about it. So I think we need to be much more engaged for our own economic interests in the region as well. Finally, uh, one of the real threats in the 21st century is cybersecurity, and the Chinese have built a, a capability, offensive capability, that is, is incredible. And we need to up our game. The fact that the Office of Personnel Management, the HR office arm of the federal government, would be hacked into and 23 million discrete files, including security clearances, are now in the hands of the communist Chinese is an example of laxity and incompetence. The Office of Personnel Management, by the way, was run by a political hack who was probably pretty good at helping Barack Obama get reelected, but clearly wasn't that competent as it related to running that, running that office. She was fired or she resigned for family reasons. There should have been much more focus on this to make sure that we have defensive and offensive capabilities that are the best and strongest in the world. China will respect strength and engagement and respect. It will not respect weakness and vacillation and incompetence. And our final question from Palm Beach Central High School. Good afternoon, Governor Bush. My name is Brooke Johnson, and I'm from the Palm Beach Central High School debate team. You have a bachelor, bachelor's degree in Latin American studies. You met your future wife while in service work in Mexico, and you even operated a bank branch in Venezuela. Your Latin American experience is impressive. Last year, you strongly criticized President Obama's decision to re restore diplomatic ties with Cuba. You stated, we should be fostering efforts that will truly lead to a fair and legitimate democracy in yeah. Cuba. 55 years of economic sanctions have not worked. Is there any other way to bring democracy to Cuba? What new policy would you take towards Cuba if you were president? I would be clear that for the United States, I would, on, the, on day one, I've said this, this is not news making, uh, maybe for you all, but I've already said it once at least or twice. I would restore, I would move our embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and I would stop diplomatic relations in Cuba. And the point is that you have to earn that relationship with the United States. Since diplomatic relations have, have started up again in the last year, Cuba's gotten more repressive in terms of imprisoning people, not allowing for dissent. And I think what we ought to say is, look, we want, we want a free Cuba. We want to have diplomatic relations. We want to lift the sanctions. But in order to do so, there are things that we should expect. We should, you should release political prisoners and allow for dissent on the island. You should allow for free elections, ultimately, and a freer economy. Most of the resources that now are coming because of people traveling to Cuba are going directly to the government to subsidize repression. It is not going to the people that would benefit from it. In fact, 90 percent of the, of the economy is controlled by the Cuban military and by the Castro brothers in their, in their regime. That is not the kind of reforms necessary to earn diplomatic status with the United States. But my hope is that when the Castro brothers go, that there will be a transition towards a free Cuba, and the United States shouldn't be obstinate about opposing that. And to the contrary, we should be supportive of the kind of reforms necessary to earn diplomatic status. As it relates to Latin America in general, I, I really find, uh, and this is not a critique of the current administration, it's really kind of a critique of our foreign policy in general over the long haul, we ignore Latin America at our peril. There are problems that come from the, from the region that we, because we're not as engaged, become overwhelming. 
migrants from, uh, from the Northern Triangle of Central America today, creating real strains on many communities across this country. The drug trade, I'm going to New Hampshire tom uh, tomorrow morning. Heroin is an epidemic in New Hampshire, and it comes across the border with the cheapest heroin. People are replacing opiates, prescribed drugs, for high-grade heroin because it's less expensive. And people are dying daily, almost, in, in New Hampshire because of it. So we should be much more engaged in the region. Uh, and I'm blessed uh, to be, um, I had my first Latin American affair with my wife, and the second was my major at the University of Texas. And I'm proud of the fact that I've lived in Venezuela, and I'm, I'm from Miami, and I have a sense of how the, the potential of the region. And I think we should be much more engaged in the region overall. Governor, a few questions from the floor. After the 2012 election, the GOP identified areas in need of improvement. <laughs> One of the prescriptions was a campaign aimed at reaching out to women and minorities. Do you think the GOP is making progress in those areas? Some of us are. <laughs> Look, I think we'll win if we have a hopeful, optimistic message and don't just stay in our comfort zone and go campaign across the country with a consistent, hopeful, conservative message, because that's the message that will lead to more prosperity for more people. But if we don't, if we just appeal to people's angst and you know, disparage people, and you can't insult your way to the presidency. That, that's never happened in the past, and it won't happen now. Uh, and so, look, it's been a little bumpy ride since in the post-12 uh, era. People are deeply anxious and angry about Washington, D.C. not working, and so, I respect that and I understand that, but I want to win. And the only way you win is to recognize that, that uh, to, get to, to win, you got to get to 50. To get to 50, you have to draw people towards your cause rather than push them away. And so we've got work to do in that regard. One particular candidate comes to mind. <laughs> the tragedy in San Bernardino brought to light the role of social media's influence in radicalizing shooters. How do we get tech companies to cooperate with the law enforcement while protecting privacy? Great question. It's complicated because of, uh, been made more complicated, it's always complicated, but it's been made more complicated by the Snowden um, data dump that now makes it hard for Europe, our European allies and others to cooperate with us internationally. And the tech companies trying to make sure that their customers are served and worrying about losing market share have basically closed the back door. And so not only do we not have the same level of cooperation, we also have the lack of trust to, to rebuild it. I think it's going it, to, it requires, I, don't, I hope we don't have to go through a series of these, of these tragic attacks that are um, induced at least by, there is some connectivity to the internet for, for us to get back to a level of cooperation that's important. One of the things that would be helpful is to allow for li liability reform for tech companies to share both for cybersecurity purposes and for intelligence purposes. If they're worried about the downside of this, to give them some liability uh, uh, protection so that they can go about their business of cooperating amongst themselves and cooperating with the government. But Snowden particularly has, his, uh, his dumping of all this into the world um, has created a real problem for our country. It's gonna take a while for us to restore, but we must, we have to. Um, the, the, the threat is that the Terrorists will use encryption to the same extent that um, many other businesses do and make it harder for us to track how they're going about their, their business. And so clearly uh, the challenge is, well, okay, so if you allow for having backdoor access to the other companies, these companies will, to the American companies, they'll say, well, then you're gonna, the platforms overseas are the ones that the terrorists will use. So it's a lot more complicated than just saying, go back the way it once was. How has the role of the selfie changed <laughs> candidacy? The selfie is now the 11th Amendment of the Bill of Rights. <laughs> it's, it's inspired by our framers and founders, apparently. Uh, it is a requirement that you take one, and I do it with great joy in my heart. <laughs> I don't know, look, it, it wasn't that long ago that people wanted signatures on things. And now, forget that. I just want, I want my damn selfie and I'm not leaving until I get it. So we spend a lot of quality time doing that. 
and hoping the person has a long enough arm, or I will take over. Just for the record, young people do it better than older people. Just to, we'll go through a little training class here. It's cooler to do it diagonally rather than straight up. Remember that. And it's better to do it higher than lower because you look skinnier. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Words of wisdom. Thank you, Governor. Yeah. Big stuff. If elected president, what would you do, what would you and your administration do to improve the uh, veterans' medical benefits? Um, the Vet Veterans Administration needs stem to stern reform. It needs to be, it needs to be, there needs to be house cleaning in ways that um, this administration has tried but has failed. First and foremost, we need career civil service reform. You saw, you followed the scandal, I'm sure, of the waiting list uh, and bonuses being given out for that and other things, $140 million last year, going out to uh, top employees in the Veterans Administration, which has 340,000 employees. It's a, it's a huge uh, enterprise. And that $140 million went out for good things, I'm sure, but some really horrific things, like kidding people off a waiting list without giving them care and having them die. And it's been identified by uh, the House Committee that only three people have been fired. That's shameful. It's criminal, in fact, I would say. And so we need career, career civil service reform, just like we did in Florida, where you don't have lifetime employment protections. It's not about the economic interests of the employees of the Veterans Administration. It's about the care of the men and women in uniform who come back home and are deserving of much higher quality than they get today. <laughs> just, to, just to give you a few more things that, to, to noodle on, I think that the construction programs ought to be done by the Army Corps. That's their skill set. Veterans Administration is not capable of building their way out of a wet paper bag, to be honest with you. The Aurora Hospital in Colorado had started at a $300 million cost. They're at $1.8 billion right now. Shameful. The IT systems, the procurement systems are obsolete. There needs to be, as I said, stem to stern uh, reforms. I think part of that is beginning to happen now with the new administrator, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And the final thing I'd suggest to you is two, two other things. One, centers of excellence seem to cry out because you have these unique challenges now of post-traumatic stress and women's health issues that are because we have many more veterans that are women. The, the Veteran Administration shouldn't be the, you know, try to be all things to all people. They ought to focus on being world class for a few selected uh, unique challenges that veterans face today, long-term disability issues and the like. And then the final thing I'd say is there is a reform that is underway, but it is tepid and small, and it needs to be expanded dramatically, which is giving veterans choices. Why should they have to go to the Veterans Administration Clinic if they're not comfortable there? Why not give them the power to choose their own private provider or their own private clinic or their own private hospital? I just know empowering people with choices makes everybody get better. Plain and simple. It did in education here in Florida, and it will as it relates to, to veterans' issues. What, can I make one other point? Because I, I want to uh, tout something. We have a lot of local officials here. Um, two, three months ago, I was in Houston, Texas, and a guy who I, I met um, woke up one day, literally, and said, I, don't, I do not want to see a homeless veteran in the streets of Houston. Now, he's a successful guy. He had the resources to draw people towards this cause. And in Houston, Texas today, there are no homeless veterans. They didn't wait for the federal government to create a program. They didn't wait for Washington to do anything. They said, this is a definition of who we are, that if there are veterans that are homeless, we better do something about it, because it's a definition of me. And today, there are no homeless in Houston, Texas. And that's what ought to happen in our country again. We need to be a bottom-up country, not a top-down country. We do it far better when it's bottom-up. And the federal government can play a supportive role. Governor, you have said that people who enter the country illegally out of an act of love for their families should be treated differently than those who overstay visas or illegally cross our borders. No, How do you so. differentiate? Or please clarify. Well, that's not accurate, for starters. That will clarify it. OK. Um, the simple fact is people do come for family. The great majority of immigrants, whether they come to overstay their visa or otherwise, they, have, they, have, they shouldn't stay. 
it's plain and simple. We need, to, we need to enforce our laws. It doesn't matter what the motivation of people are. I mean, I do believe that the motivation is not one like other candidates have talked about to kind of pound their chest and say the great majority of people here are criminals or rapists or stuff like that. No, they come because they have no opportunities and they're scared about the future of their children. But having said that, we need to control the border. And part of the border needs to be enforcing in, inside the country as well. When 40 percent of all illegal immigrants come with a legal visa and overstay, our country ought to figure out where they are, and we ought to create certainty that if you come here legally, your visa expires, you leave. If, we're, if we, we can't solve the rule of law issue, then we're never going to get to the other issues of, of legal immigration to reform that for it to be a catalyst for higher sustained growth. Because our legal immigration system is broken as well. 90% of all legal immigrants come by family. The definition of family is the most, the broadest in any country in the world. Spouse and minor children, like every other country, adult siblings and adult parents. And we have what's called chain migration. And it's not the best opportunity for us to grow our economy. Canada has more economic immigrants than the United States does, a country of one-tenth our size. They seem to have it right. We're stuck in a political quagmire. And should I be President of the United States, I would not use it as a po political wedge issue. I would forge consensus to get it fixed. And the solution is the first chapter of Immigration Wars. You can buy it for a buck ninety-nine on Amazon.com. I haven't changed my views. Candidates seem to go in the witness protection program about this issue. My views are the same they were five years ago when I wrote the book. And I think it's the right thing to do to be able to create a better America. Governor, before we get to our final two questions, we just wanted to take a moment and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. We're very appreciative. Thank, thank you, Ed. Thank you all. Now, having said that, let's get down to the final two questions. First of all, who is the funniest of your presidential fellow candidates? Wow. Um, like funny in a good way? <laughs> I'd say the guy with the quickest wit is uh, Huckabee. He's actually hilarious. Chris Christie's pretty funny as well, in a different kind of style. You can imagine a former governor from Arkansas being slightly different than a, than a current governor from Jersey, but they're both, uh, they both are pretty funny. You thought I was going to say somebody else. I would never have thought that. But oddly enough, our final question involves this. Donald Trump has been in town the past few days. What would you like to say to him should he walk into the room right now? Say, Donald, I'll take you on one-on-one -on -one in a debate, anytime, any place. You name it, and I'll do it. Governor, thank you. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Please join us January 26th for Representative Lois Frankel across the street. Happy New Year, all. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir. Nice job. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, this way. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Let me get my stuff. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice Thanks. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, Ed, that was funny. Appreciate Thanks, buddy. You got to take your mic. No, this is, is my it? mic. Good. Your mic is good. Okay. We're good. We got time. We got to go. Yeah.